All right, we're going to start this podcast off with Justin Walker, who owns Fusion Logistics Group. Justin, can you give us a brief history, kind of how you got in this industry, and you know, tell us about the products and services you provide? Sure. I, uh, I started as a screen printer many years ago, and uh, after doing that for about two years, I was never particularly good at it. So uh, naturally, I was looking towards digital printing as an alternative. Uh, there's still a level of skill required with digital printing, but in my opinion, uh, it's far less than what's required to get great results from screen printing, uh, especially when working with high-quality, full-color artwork like we tend to print with the digital process. So I uh, started looking around at different options. I finally settled on a machine uh, to get started. Owned that machine for about a year and a half. Uh, had a lot of problems with it. So I ended up going on a roller coaster ride of trying a number of different digital printing machines, trying to find one that could deliver the total package of you know, uh, well-built industrial hardware combined with uh, high-quality software for the image processing, combined with good customer support and good you know, company ethics. Uh, it's really hard to find companies that can provide all three of these things in one package. So I went through a series of about six different brands of digital printers over the last several years and uh, I finally found a model that works well for my business and I believe that uh, you know it has most of what I'm looking for. We do primarily wholesale digital printing for our customers so you know there's a lot of things that are important to me that aren't necessarily as important to other people like keeping my bottom line down and, uh, and what have you. But uh, the industry continues to develop and I want to stay at the cutting edge of that by always looking at the latest and greatest developments and making sure that we implement them into our shop. All right. I know, but I remember back, I think it was 2006 or 2007 when you were first looking to get into this, and I think I might have actually helped you get onto the trade show floor at ISS Orlando <laughs> back then. Yep, yep. Tell me some of the, or describe some of the thought process you go through when you're looking at different DTG printers, <coughs> what makes you select one over another? You know, there's a, a number of factors. I, I touched on them briefly uh, in the last question, but, you know, for the most part, I want a machine that's well built. You know, it's got to be solid. It's got to look like it's not a toy. Uh, it's got to look like it's, you know, using industrial components. If the motors that raise and lower the platen are too small, then, you know, it's not going to maintain, you know, being level. If, if, the, uh, if it's not thought out, you know, if the machine isn't well built and well thought out, then you're not going to be able to maintain perfect registration in the long run. You know, a lot of these machines will look great on the showroom floor, and they'll even work great for a, a period of time when you get them into your shop. But it's not until you run hundreds or even thousands of T-shirts through them that you start to see uh, some of the shortcomings that are inherent in the way they're built. Some machines just can never get good registration, and therefore it makes high-quality dark garment printing very difficult. The hardware is uh, one of the major factors, but of course, uh, without really good software to process the images, it's not going to get you very far. Uh, you could have the best printer in the world, but if the software doesn't know how to send uh, the image to it properly, it's not going to come out like you would expect or like you see it on the screen. So of course, I look at the rip and I make sure that it has the features that I'm looking for, but most importantly, I'm looking to see how, uh, how well it processes the artwork files. Um, you know, you could have really good hardware and really good RIP software, and so you got a machine that by all accounts is pretty solid, but if you have a company that doesn't know how to support the machine or isn't well educated on the machine, then th the inevitable problems that you face on the day-to-day, -day, you know, printing side of things, uh, it's going to be very hard for you to resolve those issues. So I want to make sure that any company I do business with provides outstanding support. You know, I want to make sure they really believe in their product that they are knowledgeable about their product to where I can call them any time with any issue and they're going to be able to resolve that issue for me quickly and efficiently. You know, there's been times in the past where I've had machines that would work great for a few months and then once things started to fall apart, the tech guys themselves had no idea how to solve the problems. And it was always one excuse after another, but the bottom line is I would spend weeks and at times up to two months where my printers weren't operating. You know, for my business, that's devastating. If you can't print orders for two months, you know, you're sinking. So, you know, you got to be sure you have a great uh, support team to lean on and, uh, you know, good hardware and good software to back that up. I want to make sure that the printer can print, you know, at a relatively decent rate of speed. But, of course, that's not my highest priority because one thing I've learned doing this for so long is 
quality is worth the wait. And even if the machine is a little bit slower, if it can produce a higher quality image to where my customers are going to get that shirt and say, not just, hey, this is a good shirt, but wow, this is amazing. You know, if I can get that reaction out of my clients, I'm willing to wait a little bit longer for the print to happen. Okay. I think I just heard recently that you moved to a new shop. Can you describe a little bit of kind of about what your shop layout looks like or entails? <clears throat> And then also, you know, some of the things that people might need to know when they're trying to set up their own new DTG print shop. Sure, sure. Um, you know, that's a good one, actually. One of the reasons we moved into a new building is because it was very difficult to control the climate, and particularly the humidity, in the building I was at before. Uh, I mean, the way the building was constructed, it was, it was like an oven. It was always, you know, hotter inside than it was outside. So we needed to find a building that you know stayed cool no matter what time of day it was, you know, no matter what the temperature was outside. We found ourselves a nice little uh, industrial office type combo complex. So we have a nice amount of warehouse space in the back and then a couple offices in the front. Uh, one thing that's important to me is to make sure that the digital printers are located in a room that's easy to control as far as climate and humidity. Uh, so we put both of our uh, printers into an office space with a drop ceiling and, and it's a relatively small room, maybe 300 square feet, probably even a little smaller than that. Uh, we put our pretreatment in the industrial area because it's not as critical, you know, the humidity is not going to affect the, the pretreatment gun that we use. So uh, in addition to that, we don't want the overspray to be affecting our print area. So we try and keep those two things separate. Um, in the print room itself, you know, we try and keep the air conditioner running all the time or if not running, we have it set to turn on automatically if the temperature goes below a certain point. We're in the process of installing an industrial humidification system in line with the HVAC system so that we'll be pumping water into the air. That way, you know, you have less problems with the ink drying up in the print heads, you have fewer problems with the printers in general, as long as you keep your humidity around 40 to 60%. So we've gone to great lengths to try and do this, and uh, it's important to understand that you can't just get one of these printers and throw it in the corner of your screen printing shop, you know, where you do all the rest of your work in a big warehouse space. It's not going to be happy. It's not going to operate properly. And in the long run, you're going to think you've got a bad machine, when in reality, it's your environment that's causing a lot of the problems. So, you know, when looking at a machine and looking at a place to, to put our business, we were sure to pick a, a spot that we had a great deal of control over and that would be a good home, a good fit for the digital printing process. Excellent. I know artwork is always one of the challenges you hear a lot of new DTG users struggling with, and some of it comes from when they get the artwork from their customer. Do you provide any recommendations to your customers in advance of how the artwork should be in, or do you try to just manipulate every piece of artwork that comes in? You know, that's a good question. Um, depending on the market that I'm catering to at the time, it will really have a big effect on that. You know, when you're dealing with uh, schools and small organizations that don't really have any background in art whatsoever, you know, there's times they're sending us Word documents with an embedded image and they expect us to convert it into the proper format, make sure the resolution is up to par, and uh, you know, subsequently get great results out of it. Uh, it's not always uh, viable to do that, but you know, especially without charging artwork fee, you know, we got it takes time to process that artwork and get it to look right. But in some cases, we try and do the best we can. For the most part, I have chosen to do my best to educate my customers on the proper way to submit artwork. We go to great lengths to try and give them all the tools they need. You know, little Photoshop actions a nice detailed description of what we need and why on our website. Um, you know, we try and give them all the information they need and then beyond that if they need our help then you know, we can send it to our art department and have them step in. But our requirements are fairly simple. Uh, we like to have our artwork submitted in RGB format. 200 DPI is usually sufficient. Anything more than that and you're just making your artwork files larger than they need to be. When you're moving around you know, 100 artwork files a day over the local network, you don't want to bog down your network traffic by having extra large 300 DPI files when there's not really going to be an increase in quality on the printed t-shirt. So 200 DPI RGB mode. PNG file format is a great option because it supports native RGB 
and because it supports transparent backgrounds, which are very important for printing on dark garments. Uh, if the artwork comes to us and it doesn't have a transparent background, we'll let the customer know and, and make sure that it was not their intention to print a big white box around their image. And if they want us to cut out the background, you know, we'll charge them a small fee to do that. But for the most part, I try and do as little artwork conversion as necessary and uh, you know, let my customers supply the artwork in the format that we need. That way there's no... Uh, there's no problems when you know we do the conversions where they're going to come back and say, oh, well, you didn't do this right. The, the only exception is the final adjustments we make to the artwork. You know, we'll open it up in Photoshop and do a little bit of a levels adjustment and a little bit of a saturation boost. Sounds complicated, but in reality, it only takes about 15 seconds per artwork file, and it's well worth uh, the increase in the quality that you get when you print the image. Okay. You mentioned some of it about you know artwork fees and stuff. <clears throat> There's a lot of different ways people have gone about setting pricing, uh, and you obviously do contract work and you also sell direct. Give us some examples of how you go about pricing to a customer. Well, when we're uh, when we're setting up pricing again, it depends on the market we're going after. Uh, with our retail business, you know it's a whole different ball game because they're paying more for the shirts, they're paying more for the printing service. We can afford to spend an hour whipping up some quick artwork for them or maybe converting their you know, napkin drawing into a, a nice high quality print for the t-shirt. You know, uh, if we're charging eight, nine dollars a print, it's not a big deal. But when we're doing our wholesale printing and every penny counts, we have our prices calculated down to a point where we know how many shirts we can print per hour. We know what our average ink cost is gonna be per shirt. We know what we need to charge to survive. And we try and trim out any of the excess so the customers that just want to you know, have us do the, the printing services are going to pay the least amount. But then we also offer many add-ons. So in a lot of ways, our wholesale service is more of a, uh, of a buffet. You can come in and you select only what you want. Um, if they want us to do the artwork, you know, there's an extra charge there because that's not calculated into the time it takes us to do the printing when we're working with wholesale customers. But uh, again, when we're working with retail customers, we have a higher markup, we can work some of those things into the cost, but when we're working with the wholesale uh, customers, it's completely different. All right, one of the hidden little cost on behalf of a DTG user or any garment decorator is the stuff after it actually gets printed, the packaging, shipping, and stuff. Can you give us a little description of you know some of the things that you've gone through over the years and how you've made that a little bit more efficient? Sure, we've had uh, we've had clients that have had some pretty strange requests in the past. I mean, at one point we had a customer that wanted us to roll every shirt that we printed into a sort of sushi roll, uh, right down to putting a pair of chopsticks in with it for the authentic feel. And then we would put that in a little plastic sushi type box for mailing. It was a very strange request, but that's what the customer wanted and that's what we did. For the most part, our standard shipping includes you know, folding up the shirts, putting them in a box, and sending them out. But we do a lot of drop shipping to the end users as well. So in that case, sometimes the customer wants us to spruce it up a bit. Uh, we use uh, poly bags that we pick up from Uline. And just putting the shirts, folding them and putting them into the poly bags really has a big effect on the perceived value of the product when received by the end user. You know, when they receive it in a nice, uh, a nice clear bag, you know, inside their mailer, it, uh, it just makes, it, it looks nicer, it looks more professional. I think they appreciate it a little bit more than just a t-shirt stuffed into a, a mailer, an envelope. Um, we, of course, use UPS WorldShip to try and make our shipping as efficient as possible, print all of our labels, you know, quickly. Uh, our system is plugged in with our database directly, so when we input the order number, it'll pull up the shipping information, and we don't have to manually type that information. We try and eliminate as many redundant steps as possible throughout the entire process, not just the shipping stage. Um, that's it. I mean, shipping is a fairly straightforward process. It's important to have a, a separate area to do your shipping in to try and keep everything uh, organized. But uh, we really try and cater to the customer's needs. If they want us to put a mailer in their, uh, in their orders that we're sending out to their customers, in addition to the printed shirt, 
will do that. But again, everything we sell is piecemeal. So if they want that added service, there's a small added cost for that. Early on, I used to go above and beyond for these customers and really try and throw in as much as I could for free. And I found out at the end of the month, no matter how busy I was, somehow I was always paying out more than I was taking in. And that's because we weren't charging appropriately for all the little things that are involved in the process, like individually packaging and shipping the 200 shirts that we just printed today. You know, that takes a great deal of time and it takes extra labor. And if you don't account for that, you're going to go out of business real fast. Excellent. Can you talk a little bit about the different types of garments that you printed on and the fabric contents and some of you know, the results that you've gotten out of this? You know, I've always been one to try and experiment and push the boundaries of what can be printed on and how. And so we've tried uh, a number of different products and garment types to print on and, and fabric types in general. Uh, as a general rule of thumb with the DTG printing, we try and stick primarily to 100% cotton. We have the best success with it. The inks look better. They wash better. They're all around, uh, you know, they work better on cotton. Uh, going one step further, ring spun cotton seems to print even better than standard cotton. We, when we can talk the customers into it, prefer to print on Anvil 980, American Apparel, District Threads, you know, any premium t shirt with a very tight knit and a, a nice soft ring spun cotton. The prints come out better and they wash better and the customer's happier. A lot of times the shirt fits better too, so that's just an added bonus. We've printed on 50-50 blends in the past. I know it's difficult sometimes to find hooded sweatshirts that are anything but 50-50. So every now and again we are stuck uh, with that type of fabric. But again, we try and avoid it. We try and keep it simple. Even if we tell the customers up front, hey, 50-50 isn't going to print very good, if they give us 50-50 garments and we print them and they don't turn out great, the customer always ends up blaming us. So it's better just as a policy to stick with 100% cotton. I know there are a lot of options for uh, working around that, including various pretreatment chemicals available that make polyester printing more viable, and that's something we're certainly looking into right now. Um, even when we print tote bags and art canvas and stuff like that, for the most part, it's all cotton-based uh, rather than you know artificial or synthetic fibers. We get better results, and uh, we don't have as many problems with the printing process. You mentioned a couple of things right there that aren't really necessarily considered garments per se, with the tote bags and the art canvases. And you definitely, anytime you walk a trade show floor, you can see that there's a lot of different things, a variety of stuff that's printed. In your experience, do you find those to be really profitable and something that your customers want, or is it you know just an ancillary item? You know, sometimes it's just fun to print on different items. Uh, you know, in the past I've printed on things like light switch covers and various other rigid substrates. Typically it requires some sort of pre-coating, like uh, with a water-based primer or something like that. You can pick up a white water-based primer at Home Depot for a couple bucks, and you can coat all sorts of things that you can print on. But uh, some things do actually have a, a very high value to print on for the end user. Art Canvas is a great example. We can go down to Michael's Craft Store, pick up a pre-stretched 16 by 20 canvas for anywhere between 8 and 12 bucks, depending on the quality of the canvas we want to get. We can print that and sell it for 80 to 100 dollars, no problem. You know, this is not necessarily the highest level of artwork reproduction, but it certainly produces a fine pr uh, quality product that most end users are very, very happy with. Um, you know, we've worked with photographers in the past and printing their artwork onto art canvas is a really great market to get into because your average t-shirt you might have one dollar, three dollars, five dollars or even ten or twenty dollars in markup. That doesn't even compare to what you can mark up an art canvas for. You know, it takes the same amount of time to print. You have uh, fewer issues because you're not using any white ink or anything like that. And it's really a creative way to get more profit out of your investment into the DTG printer. You want to try and branch out and not just stick with one product, but really see what the DTG printer can do. Okay. Anybody can go on the internet now and when you do a search for DTG, you're almost guaranteed to see something that talks about required maintenance and some of the challenges that come up. 
Can you talk a little bit about some of the maintenance steps that you go through both on your printer and in your pre-treating application process that keeps you from experiencing those challenges? Absolutely. Uh, what's that phrase? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of solution or something. You know, if, if you put the time in and you, uh, you take care of the problems before they become problems, you're going to be a lot happier in the long run. If you wait until your machine is having problems and then start to you know, do maintenance on it and clean it out, it's really not an efficient way to run your business. What we tend to do is spend about 10 to 15 minutes a day just cleaning the printer really thoroughly. We get in there with our, you know, our swabs and our cleaning solution. We make sure that the capping station is well maintained and no ink build up around the seal because if ink starts to build up and dry up on the seal to your capping station, there's not going to be a good seal and your cleaning, uh, your printer's internal cleaning cycles are not going to be effective because the pump won't be able to create a vacuum. Um, we try and get in there where the wiper blade is and make sure that there's no ink building up in there, no ink on any of the plastic gears which might cause the teeth to break off as it builds up more and more. When you start to hear uh, loud grinding sounds and stuff like that coming from your printer, it's usually because the gears are grinding through dried up ink and it's really causing the printer to strain itself. You know, and there's no reason to put your $20,000 plus investment through that kind of abuse. 10 minutes a day is all it takes and you can be a much happier printer. Uh, our pretreatment is a pretty simple process. We, in our shop, use a Wagner power, or the hand power sprayer to pretreat our shirts manually. Um, the DuPont pretreatment specifically is fairly sticky and it can tend to clog things up or even deteriorate certain types of materials. Um, we like to take our pretreater apart at least on a weekly basis, soak it in water, give it a nice thorough rinse, clean it out so that no pretreatment is just sitting in there. Uh, ruining our equipment. You know, it's not an expensive investment. You can get a Wagner power sprayer for you know sixty dollars at Home Depot, but why replace it if you don't have to? Just spend a few hours or a few minutes here and there cleaning it out, and you're going to have a lot fewer problems in the long run. Okay. To wrap up this podcast, is there anything else that you think is important for anybody that's looking into getting into DTG printing? that they should be aware of or consider before actually jumping in and making that investment? You know, we could go on for hours and hours on that point alone. I think uh, there's a lot of things that potential buyers and people who are interested in getting involved in this process should be aware of. Uh, one thing is know your market. Understand what your business plan is. If you're a wholesaler like me and you're, you're operating on razor thin margins, then you're going to have different needs and desires compared to someone that's just doing an online clothing line and selling shirts for $25 a pop online. Um, and on that same note, someone that's printing for you know, high schools and, and certain niche groups is also going to have certain needs and desires that they're looking for that might be different from mine. So never take someone else's word straight up as, as this is the best machine and this is what you need to get. You really need to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of each individual machine and make a decision that's right for you. Um, another thing is any printer that you're considering, be sure you see it in person. Try and go out to the manufacturer, print as many sample prints as you can. Before I made my last decision on a purchase, I remember we went out there, my production manager and myself, and we printed at least 100 or 200 shirts before we would even consider buying the machine. We wanted to see not only how it operated printing one or two shirts, but how does it operate over several hours or over a day or two or three? And we were convinced and we ended up making a purchase and we have not regretted it. Uh, in the past, I would make a decision based on machines I saw at trade shows only and that didn't always work out in my favor. So really do your homework, don't take someone else's word for it and be sure you're taking into consideration what your priorities are and what you're looking for in a digital printer. Justin, I want to thank you for your time. For those listeners that want to get in contact with you for contract DTG printing, what's the best way for them to contact you? Uh, we're a high-tech company. The best way to get a hold of us is to go to our website. That is www.fusionlogisticsgroup.com. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you, Mark, and uh, thanks for taking the time to interview.